risk review allows us to identify the cause of the stress. It's going to teach us to recognise signs and symptoms and understand causes and effects, and also how to construct, conduct the risk assessment, allowing us to help identify work-related causes of stress. We're very tight on time tonight, and if we can, we'd very much like to get into learning some relaxation techniques ourselves, and that's certainly something perhaps I could do with. Uh, Neil was a leading international expert on stress management and well-being. Engaging and inspiring motivational speaker and a success coach, he's got a long-standing interest in neurolinguistic <coughs> linguistic programming, hypnotherapy, and strategies to promote well-being. He's the author of a publication called Neurolinguistic Programming, a Practical Guide, the 10 Step Stress Solutions. He's the founder and director of the Stress Management Society and a leading international authority on stress management and well-being. Neil was also regularly featured in the media as a BBC expert on stress, as well as newspapers and magazines. So I'm going to hand over to Neil, and he'll introduce himself. I will just ask the normal, when we get to the question times, if you do have questions, please put your hand up. Alex will come around with a microphone, just so that everybody can hear the questions. So thank you very much, and hand over to Neil. How many of you have experienced stress before? Most of you. How many of you are concerned about the impact that stress has on your health, your well-being, productivity at work? Okay, quite a few of you. How many of you are concerned about the health and safety implications of stress? Okay. How many of you are not concerned about stress at all in any way, shape or form? Great, you're all in the right place in that case. I'd like to meet myself after that introduction. I'm not sure I can, I can live up to that expectation, but the one thing that I can say is I am head of the Stress Management Society and I know a few things about stress having had a few experiences of my own which led me to set up the Stress Management Society. The society has been around for about 11 years, we're set up as a not-for-profit organisation primarily to raise awareness on the impact of stress, the cultural and commercial costs of stress, from a risk management pers perspective how exposed we are. Actually we do a lot of work with insurance companies that recognise that stress is a, is, a, is a risk management issue. And once we've recognised that impact, what we can do about it, how we can minimise the impact that stress has on the working environment, how it impacts productivity, efficiency, and as I said, health and safety. Stress <laughs> is a health and safety risk hazard like any other workplace uh, health and safety risk hazard, and we need to recognise it as such, and it's recognised as such under the law. But the biggest challenge we face when working with most of our clients is they don't really clearly understand what stress is. And part of my job here today is to demystify it for us to at least be able to walk away from here with a better understanding of what stress actually is. But also, let me just get a sense from you. What do you want to achieve from, from this valuable time of yours that you've invested? Because time is your most valuable resource. And how many of you can think of at least 100 other things you could be doing rather than sitting here with me for the next hour? <laughs> Thanks for your honesty. And how many of you are getting stressed about the fact that there are things that need to happen outside this room that aren't happening in this room, aren't happening outside this room because you're sat here with me for the next hour? Okay. And have you actually considered not attending because you were getting stressed about the things that you need to do rather than actually attending here today? Thanks for your honesty. And I fully appreciate that. I'm firmly committed to, you, to ensuring you get as much value from this valuable time you've invested in today as possible. But I want to get a sense from you, what do you hope to achieve? What motivates you to attend this session? What are you hoping to achieve over the next hour? I'll get a couple of responses from you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so minimizing the stress. Okay. Good. Anyone else? At the back, yeah. Excuse me? Okay. So how to stop someone actually getting stress in the first place? Okay, yeah. Now uh, where we can look at that. What else? How to stop uh, an organization being out of dial. And there's a wonderful objective there. Thank you so much for raising that. Most of the work we do nowadays, this is very different from when we started uh, life about 11 years ago. Most of the work we do now, nowadays is at board level, where companies are starting to understand that there's a pound, <coughs> shillings, and tens of cost to stress. And actually, scarily, many of the clients we're working with at the moment have approached us because they have a suicide at work. 
I'm, I'm talking about at least three clients a month are approaching us because someone's taking their own life. There is a very serious implication to stress. But part of our job as health and safety professionals is to create a strong business case for people to, to understand that this is something we need to take seriously and to get buy-in at the highest level. So, great, thank you. One or two more. Get them in the back. So understanding what's normal stress and what's, what's undue pressure. Okay, so last one. It's very similar to the last one. How, how can we differentiate or identify personal stress from work stress? Okay, how can we differentiate between personal stress and work stress? Well, actually, we'll talk about that. It's not that easy because it all gets rolled up into one. But the important thing for us to bear in mind is regardless of what the cause of the stress is, if it's impacting someone's ability at work, we have a duty of care responsibility to, to do something about it. So it's very difficult to, to differentiate because let me ask you, if you're stressed out because of something that happened at home, let's say you've got some challenges going at home, do you leave them on the kitchen table before you go into work? Some people can, but it's not easy to do so. Equally, if you're stressed out because of something that happened at work, do you leave it on your desk before you go home? Again, we'd like to, but it's not always easy to do so. Before we, all, before we get into any of that, I think we need to have an understanding of what stress actually is. I think it would be important for us to actually define stress. So if we as a group get commissioned by the Oxford Dictionary to define stress, how can we define stress? What does it mean? What is it? Adverse reaction to excessive pressure. Adverse reaction to excessive pressure, yeah, good. What else? Yeah. Physiological response, yeah. I think that um, stress is actually a natural energy that we need in order to interact with our environment. Okay. But however, it can become ex excessive as well. And Absolutely. Think excess stress is what actually is bad. Okay, so excess stress? Fight, fight. Fight or flight, we split. Okay. Have you heard of fight or flight before? What is fight or flight? What it says. <laughs> The natural response we have to <coughs> run away from an enemy or to have a fight with it. Absolutely. <coughs> we, 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 we produce adrenaline. It's a natural, instinctive, primitive response given to us by nature for a very good reason. And the first thing I should say is I'm a huge fan of stress. I think it's a wonderful thing. If it wasn't for stress, we wouldn't be sit here in the, sitting here in the room today having this discussion because our species would literally be extinct. In modern life, we tend to demonize stress, but actually it serves a useful and valid purpose. We think of one of our common ancestors, a gentleman we'll call Caveman Joe, strolling through the jungle on his way back to the cave to watch cave football on the cave telly with the cave wife, saving two tiger pouts out in front of him. He's got one or two choices to deal with that situation. Either number one, turn and leg it as quickly as he can to escape from danger, or dive on the tiger's back and do what he can to overpower him. That is why nature gave us this response of stress. However, in modern life, most of us are getting stressed in situations where there's nothing to fight and nothing to run away from. We're stuck on a tube train that's delayed. We're sat at our desk with you know, overwhelming deadlines. We're um, you know, sitting in a car in a traffic jam. And we've gone into a state of physical preparation, yet there is no physical response required. And that's where the modern day challenge of stress comes into play. But I'm not here to say it's a good thing or a bad thing. What if I was standing here attempting to deliver this presentation and I'm really, really, really stressed. How's that likely to impact my performance? If I was highly stressed, in what ways might, might it negatively impact my performance? You could also freeze. Okay, so absolutely, we, got, we talk about fight or flight, but many people in modern life suffer from rabbit in the headlights. Anyone ever experienced that? Got tons of stuff to do, excessive pressure, excessive demand, and you are literally taken out of the game because you're highly stressed. What else could happen? If I was really, really stressed, how is it likely to impact my performance? Your mouth would dry out, so therefore you can't speak very well. Okay, I might not be able to speak very well. Yeah. Don't think in Okay, so I might not be thinking clearly. I might be jumping from subject to subject. Might be getting confused. Yeah. Okay, but how would that impact my performance? Well, it could impact your health. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay, so if I'm stressed, my mind's going to be racing. I might be speaking very quickly, jumping from subject to subject, not having a coherent flow in what I'm delivering. And if I'm stressed, that's going to start to have an impact on your experience. Now, I've been delivering these presentations for more than 12 years. I've literally written a few books on the subject. I train other people to deliver these presentations. I know this stuff inside out like the back of my hand. But what can happen to information you know that well if you're really stressed? You forget a mental block, blank out. And I've never had that experience before. Again, when we're talking about from a health and safety perspective, people know that what the policies, processes, and procedures are, but mental block, blank out, cut corners, make mistakes. So we now start to see how it has serious health and safety implications. So at one end of the spectrum, do we all agree, if I was highly stressed, it would negatively impact my performance? What about the other end of the spectrum? I have no stress. To the point where I'm not even bothered. I don't care what happens over the next hour. How's that likely to impact my performance? Probably right. <laughs> would open my front door, I've seen it was raining outside, and we'll solve this, I'm going to watch TV. But you're absolutely right. Why would we ever do anything? Where would our motivation come from if we didn't have a little bit of stress about the consequences of the, action, or, 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 of the actions that we have ahead of us? Why would Caveman Joe have ever left the warmth and comfort and safety of his cave if he wasn't stressed about the consequences of what would happen if he didn't go and hunt and gather food? So if I wasn't stressed, I'd be bored, sluggish, lethargic, have no energy, no passion, no enthusiasm. And do we all agree that would also negatively impact my performance? So the first thing I want to share with you is that stress isn't a good thing or a bad thing, even though some people talk about good stress and bad stress. I don't necessarily subscribe to that point of view. I think it's more of a spectrum. And it doesn't matter what you're doing. Whether you're about to get on the pitch and play a game of football in a World Cup final, whether you're about to run a 100-meter race, whether you're sitting down at your desk about to start a, a report, um, whether you're commuting to work, it doesn't matter what the task is. There is an optimum space in which you can operate. If your stress levels are too high, you'll reach burnout eventually. Where stress levels peak and you will have, uh, it'll have a negative impact on your health. But at the other end of the spectrum, you'll be bored, sluggish, lethargic. You'll have no motivation to get anything done. I fully appreciate most of you will be able to relate to this space up here, but do we all agree this would be as damaging to performance as being up here, but in a different way? And there's an optimum space in between the two that I would describe as the performance zone. The space in which we can drive our best performance, regardless of the task. And our job is to recognize when people are getting above the performance zone towards burnout, what we can do to, to, to rein that in. And obviously, if we've got people that are lacking motivation, lacking focus, as I said, that can be as damaging to performance and what we can do to actually raise their motivation levels. But I'd like to spend a bit of time actually working with you to define stress, because we struggle with this. We came to existence about 11 years ago. We were speaking to all the major professional bodies that deal with stress, the medical professionals, we spoke to the NHS, we've spoken to um, uh, people from the psychology community, we've even spoken to some health and safety professionals, uh, we've been to the health and safety executive. We found that actually, depending on who, who you're talking to, you'll get a slightly different definition of stress. All the various different experts that, that look at stress have a slightly different way of defining it, depending on which angle they're looking at it from. And then purely by chance, I was on my way to New York, I was sitting next to an individual, we got talking, had a glass of wine, seemed a really interesting chat. Eventually the conversation got around to what we did for a living. Uh, so I asked him what he did for a living, and he said he was, uh, he was into stress testing. I was like, oh, that's really interesting, me too. <laughs> he, he, didn't stress, he didn't have a background in psychology, he wasn't a doctor. He used to stress test bridges and buildings and bits of metal. He was a structural engineer. But he knew more about stress than pretty much anyone I'd ever come across. And the way he defined it and explained it was so clear, so concise, so powerful, we ended up adopting his definitions as our own. That's what I'd like to share with you today. How do you think a structural engineer defines stress? It's a false action upon something which is likely to distort it. Absolutely. What he offered me when I asked him about stress was this. This is how he defined stress to me. He actually scribbled this on a napkin. Do you know what that is? Oh, sorry. Can you see now? Force over something equals pressure. Does anyone know what that is? Force over area equals pressure. Now, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't very good with equations at school, so when he offered me that, it meant very little to me. So I asked him to <coughs> explain what he meant by that in a little bit more detail. So he flipped the napkin over, and what he drew up for me at that point was 
so clear, so concise, so powerful, it's what we adopted as our own definition. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. Now, I'm going to apologise in advance for my artistic skills. I did spend much of my youth watching Rolf Harris and Tony Hart, and none of it seems to have rubbed off. I probably shouldn't admit the Rolf Harris thing. <laughs> <laughs> In saying that, I wrote a letter to Jimmy Savile. I'm so lucky he didn't write back. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Hopefully you'll be able to figure out what I'm drawing here. Can you see what it is? Yeah, thank you. That's my best artistic definition of Tower Bridge. And let's say on this particular... <laughs> I did warn you I'm not very good with art. Forget the art. Hopefully you get the idea. It's a bridge. And on, on the bridge, on this particular day, Transport for London have gone on strike. I know that's wildly unrealistic, they never go on strike, but let's say they have, and they've parked all their red double-decker buses onto the bridge, filled to the top with union reps all discussing their various demands. And then we've had some pretty crazy weather in the south of England recently, and because of the excessive rain we've been having, there's been a tidal surge on the Thames, and HMS Belfast has got washed onto the bridge. And... <laughs> And Mayor Boris, because of the capacity issues of having the runway airport, uh, uh, sorry, Heathrow Airport, has decided to build another runway across the top of Tower Bridge. And we've got a couple of Airbus A380s, some Boeing 747s. Had an escape at London Zoo, and all the elephants, rhinos, giraffes have rushed onto the bridge because they heard there was some food going. We've got some heavy machinery on there because they're doing some construction work, some cranes and uh, some JCBs. If I put enough weight, enough load, enough demand onto that bridge, ultimately what's going to happen? It's going to collapse. Before it collapses, how do we know? What clues, what feedback, what signs will it give us to suggest it's not very load effectively? It's going to crack. Bow, buckle, groans, creaks. There'll be some stress fractures. So it's given us plenty of feedback. If we take no action, the bridge is liable to collapse. But before it collapses, we've got one of two choices that we can take to prevent the bridge from collapsing. What can we do? We could remove the load, absolutely, or Reinforce the bridge, concrete blocks, iron girders underneath to better equip the bridge to bear that load. Now, when he offered that, me that analogy, the first thing I thought to myself is, hold on a minute, people are exactly the same. Let's say we finish this session, you know, the, the AGM is done, you're heading home, and as you leave, you pull out your Blackberry, your iPhone, you just to quickly check your messages. And whilst you've been sat here this evening, you've had 3,142 new emails come in. Some of you looking relieved, is that all? No, we get 10,000. 200 of those are marked as super urgent. You know you're going to need to get onto these as, as quickly as possible. There's some serious health and safety issues that need to be addressed straight away. But also you notice that there's some voicemails flashing. Pick them up and the first one is from your children's child minder. They're with a child minder this evening. Uh, and if you don't have children, pretend like you do. And they've got chicken pox and nits at the same time. So you need to get home, organise childcare and all the hassle that's going to go with that. Um, there's another message from the car park where you parked your car. You parked your car at the station before you drove here and the security guard of the car park's phoning you to let you know your car's blown up in the car park. No apparent reason, it's just spontaneously combusted. Alright, these are ridiculous examples, but if I kept going, if I kept going and put more and more pressure, more load, more demand on you as an individual, what would happen eventually? Collapse. Do you agree a person, just like a bridge, has an ultimate breaking point? Regardless of how big and strong the bridge is, whether it's Tower Bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge, it doesn't matter how strong the bridge is, it has an ultimate breaking point. Would you agree with that? A person, regardless of how resilient they are, how broad their shoulders are, how mentally tough they are, also has an ultimate break point. You put enough pressure on a person for long enough, they too will collapse under excessive load. The same could be said of a team or a whole organization, for that matter. What does it look like when a person collapses? I'm talking all out, bridge gone. What does that look like in a person? Okay, so from a mental perspective, what do you think the ultimate collapse looks like? Breakdown, absolutely. You can have a mental and emotional breakdown. But from a physical perspective, what's the first organ in the body we experience stress? Heart. The heart. So before your brain has even registered your stress, your heart has already reacted. So what do you think can happen to someone that has excessive amounts of pressure for extended periods of time? Heart attack, heart disease, which coincidentally is the number one killer on the planet in 2014. But the other one, the one I've already mentioned, where people are seeking the ultimate permanent solution to a temporary problem. What is that? Suicide, take your own life. Now, even though it's not reported, I, I, I'm a, 
BBC is expert on stress, so anything stress-related happens in the media, and they want a spokesperson, they'll come to me. And we've had a, a number of quite serious and significant issues with suicide with many of the clients we're working with. It's, 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 it's actually, scarily, a very common issue. And I was talking to a journalist recently, and I was like, it doesn't make it into the news. Why do we not report suicide? I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the BBC have a rule that they don't report suicide unless there is another reason for it. But as a blanket ruling, they don't report it because they don't want to be seen to be promoting it as an issue. The reason I'm raising this, often workplace stress is wrapped up in a whole range of complex issues that are contributing factors to someone seeking that ultimate permanent solution to a temporary problem. Often, the work issue is the straw that broke the camel's back. I'll give you a few real life examples of ones that you would have heard of. The nurse in the Kate Middleton story. You know, the prank phone call from the radio presenters in Australia. Silly issue. Um, shouldn't have been a reason for someone to take their own life. However, that prank phone call was the straw that broke the camel's back. She had underlying mental health problems. She had issues going on outside of work. She had relationship problems. That issue at work caused the house of cards to collapse. The problem was she hadn't been risk assessed to see whether she was fit to be at work. She should never have been at work in the first place because she wasn't fit to be there because of all the other things that were going on in her life. And this is where we have a, a, not just a legal, but a moral obligation to ensure that the people that are, are out working for, for, for our organizations are safe, fit, and healthy to be there. Because a lot of these deaths are absolutely preventable. And ultimately, stress does kill. Stress itself doesn't kill, but it leads to issues that do. And this is where, if we are getting better at recognizing it early, we can take appropriate measures to prevent some of those serious and significant impacts that we're <coughs> likely to experience. But thankfully, the bridge collapsing, in, you know, in broader terms, is, is, isn't as much of an issue as what happens before that. And more people will be able to relate to what it's like when the bridge is bowing and bucking, groaning and creaking. We don't often experience the collapse, but every single one of you in this room at some stage would have experienced the Boeing and Buckingham Bridge. What does that look like? The bridge hasn't collapsed yet, but it's threatened to do so. What does that look like? What does that feel like? How do we know when the bridge isn't coping too well? Sleepless nights. Sleepless nights, yeah. Headaches, yeah. Excuse me. Time of work, yeah, absenteeism. So again, this is a, 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 another clear measure of high levels of stress is that people take time off of work. Absenteeism literally means when you're not fit to work and you take the time to recover. That could either be directly as a result of stress or any other number of issues of which are caused by stress, whether that be musculoskeletal issues, allergies, digestive problems, to um, more serious illnesses. In fact, according to the NHS, up to 70% of all visits to the GP in England and Wales will be attributed back to stress. That's not people going to the doctor saying, doctor, I'm stressed, but the illness or ailment they're going to the doctor with could be, uh, stress could be a major contributing factor. In fact, all top four of the, 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 the top four things that are most likely to kill a human being on the planet today, because they don't know what they are, heart disease is number one, so they don't know what the other three are. Cancer, type 2 diabetes, and stroke. Stress is a essentially a major contributing factor to all four of those. So what is it, what else are we likely to pick up on when the bridge is bone and buckling? So absenteeism is one issue when people are taking the time to recover, but something that's actually three times as costly as absenteeism. Mistakes. Mistakes. Mistakes, yeah. Fighting in your workplace, arguments. Yeah, fighting, arguments, disputes, it's personal conflicts, yeah. Alcohol. Alcohol consumption, yeah. Physical appearance. Physical appearance, yeah. People losing pride in their appearance. Uh, you know, not shaving, washing hair, not putting clean clothes. Hygiene standards can drop, absolutely. Presenteeism, that was what I was looking for. So absenteeism was you're not fit to work and you take the time to recover. What's presenteeism? Yeah. Well, presenteeism, as I would describe it, is when you're not fit to work, but you turn up anyway. You just continue to soldier on regardless. That's a good thing, right? We want people to just pull their socks up and get on with it. Or do we? What's the, what's the impact of turning up for work if you're not fit to be there? That's productive. Going back to what you said about making mistakes, yeah? 
the quality of work in here? Dangerous. Dangerous. Now again, going on to the health and safety implications for stress. If someone's bridge is borrowed and buffing, they're not fit to be there, what are the potential health and safety implications? Excuse me? Can they be relied on as part of the team? Can they be relied on as part of the team, yeah? Well, about 30, 35% of all of our business comes from the oil and gas sector. They take stress and health and safety issues very seriously. I've actually been, I've got into serious trouble because I didn't hold the handrails when walking up the stairs of uh, one of our, our clients up in Aberdeen. Or I didn't reverse park my car and I was fine for doing so. Because they take health and safety very seriously. But what is the implications of being in an environment where health and safety is taken that seriously if you're stressed? Essentially, what could that lead to? You could make a mistake. Yeah, you could cut corners, not follow processes, procedures. And what could those mistakes lead to? Accident, injury, or possibly even death. Yes. This is where it's really important we do bear in mind that, as I said, you know, I'll say it again, that stress is a health and safety risk hazard like any other, and we need to recognize it as such. In saying that, sadly, the law hasn't explicitly recognized stress as a health and safety risk hazard. It's implied. And I'm sure you're all aware that we have a legal obligation to risk assess for the use of display screen equipment. If you sit in front of a monitor, there's a legal requirement to risk assess for it. And yet to come across a single individual that's committed suicide because their monitor was set up incorrectly, or had a heart attack, or any other kind of very serious illness because their monitor was set up incorrectly. I can tell you dozens of people this year who have taken their own lives who have had very serious illnesses because they were stressed and workplace stress was a contributing factor. Yet sadly, it's not yet legal obligation to explicitly risk assess for stress. It's wrapped up within the whole range of very complex health and safety laws, which I'm sure you're all aware of. But when we've, we've quizzed the health and safety executive about this, because they're not clear, are we legally required to risk assess for stress? And their answer was no. It's recommended, it's part of best practice. We are required to provide a workplace that's safe and healthy but there isn't anything that specifically says you are required to risk assess for workplace stress. This is obviously something we're looking to change and we've been lobbying and speaking to various different people to see if we can get people to take this a little bit more seriously. But this is part of our responsibility as health and safety professionals to understand that stress is a very serious health and safety risk hazard. What else? How else can we tell that the bridge is borrowing a buckling? What are the other signs and symptoms to suggest that the bridge isn't coping effectively? Absolutely. So you could have people that are withdrawn, not communicating, not engaging. Or what about the other end of the spectrum? Picking up everything. Yeah, becoming animated, aggressive, um, <coughs> loud, you know, voicing their opinion uh, very strongly. What else? What about the amount of time we spend at work when the bridge is buying a bike? You've got a ton of demand on your bridge. What might happen to the amount of time we spend at work? Yeah, it might increase. You might spend longer at work, getting in early, leaving late, not taking breaks, eating your sandwich at your desk. Does that mean we get more done? No. This comes back to the, the whole issue of presenteeism. We're continuing to put in more and more effort, more time, more hours of work, and actually we are less productive, making more mistakes, and we're experiencing what was described as presenteeism. It's what I would describe as the laws of diminishing return actually getting people to understand that, that more hours doesn't necessarily result in more output. What else? What are the other implications of the bridge borrowing and buffering? How else can we tell? Increasing inefficiency, Absolutely. Increasing inefficiency, decreasing productivity, morale can dip, staff turnover can increase. There's a number of different ways that we can pick this up, and there's a number of different ways we can measure the impact of stress by looking at it from this perspective. We have the same choice as we do with the actual bridge. We can either, number one, alleviate the load. Now, I'll be honest with you, that's not an easy option. We have responsibility, we've got commitments, and many of the organizations that we work with have kind of got the strap line more for less. They don't necessarily have the ability to 
bring in more resources or spend more money or take demand away from people. In fact, they're looking to increase demand on people. So one of it could be addressing inefficiencies. There's a lot of stuff that we have on our bridge that doesn't need to be on our bridge, or it doesn't need to be on our bridge right now. Or we might not necessarily have the, the most effective strategies to cope with our workload. Part of our work is to help companies to recognize what those inefficiencies are and how to address those. And technology is a major contributing factor to that. Technology is resulting us from jumping from task to task, from job to job. And actually, we don't have the most productive and efficient ways of doing things. The technology that's supposed to make our lives easier is actually slowing us down. But where we have our real power is down here. What can we do to provide support, to strengthen individuals' bridges, to better equip them to cope with the heavy demand of modern life? What kind of things can we do to support like good management and supervision? Management and supervision, yeah. What else? Training, education, raising awareness, absolutely. What else? Motivation. Yeah, motivation. Effective um, communication. Effective communication, thank you. Absolutely, awareness, raising awareness, making it okay to have these discussions. You know, often, Making it okay to have these discussions allows a pressure valve release moment. It's when we're walking around not feeling comfortable we can talk about our concerns and our issues and you keep the lid and I keep the lid on it until eventually your bridge collapses. So actually making it okay to talk about these things. Working together to create a culture of well-being. Now this isn't some kind of pink and fluffy thing which involves having massage therapists in the working environment. I can help, but, but actually any company that wants to achieve success in the modern economy has to understand that the well-being and strategic well-being initiatives are wrapped up within this. Mm -hmm. You know, I can offer you a couple of examples as part of our discussion today. What do you imagine are, uh, well, before I even get to that question, what are the top companies on the planet today? In terms of, you know, profitability, success, the ones that are often cited as the top companies on the planet. Google, Google often comes up. Yeah, Google and and Apple and those kind of companies. And Microsoft have kind of dropped off the list a little bit recently. Think of Google as a starting point. What would you imagine it's like to work in a company like Google? In fact, it's, it, it's so well talked about, they made a film out of it. What would you imagine it's like to work in a company like Google? Okay, so table tennis tables, play areas. I've spent a bit of time in some of the Google offices. And it's colorful, some of them have got slides from floor to floor. Sacramento, they've got 21 beach volleyball courts, they've got sleep areas, meditation pods, they've got free food on every bank of desks, and you know, all you can drink all day long, not alcohol, obviously, that's on Friday, pizza and alcohol. But ultimately, they've created an environment where they've thought of everything. You know, staff well-being and employee well-being is something they invest very, very heavily in. But not because they care about their employees, I'm sure they do, they're a very clever company. Do you imagine the average working day is for a Google employee? 24 hours. <laughs> About 12 and a half hours. Do you know if you work for Google, they'll do your laundry for you and they'll have someone run to the bank and sort your banking out and they've got creches if you've got children. I think it's about 10% of Google's employees don't get paid a wage. They work for free. And for every internship position, do you know how many applications they get? About 10,000. People are bending over backwards to work for Google for nothing. They've recognized that actually for every pound, every dollar we spend on employee well-being, we're getting about $50 back in gain productivity and efficiency. This is a company that's changing the world, making space technology and cars that drive themselves. And they recognize that actually if we create an environment where we're taking care of their every need, then we're going to get 150% of our people. Now, OK, when I offer an example like Google, people roll their eyes in the back of the head because they're big company with bottomless pits of money and they can afford to do this. Japanese companies use it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's not new stuff. None of this is new stuff. But let me offer you an example that probably will get your attention. What was the top place to work for in the UK in 2012? If you don't know, if you didn't read the, the Sunday Times list of the top 100 places to work for, you won't believe me when I tell you. No? <laughs> no, everyone always says John Lewis. Thank you. Someone that read the, the, the report. Iceland, as in, used to be called Bijam Iceland. I don't know if you remember, but in 2007, Iceland went into administration. They were closing shops faster than you could say frozen chips. 
they were on the verge of disappearing off a high street. And they made a very brave and bold decision for a company that's gone into administration. A company that's in the retail sector. Firstly, they stopped advertising. They stopped giving money to Kerry Cokeface and <laughs> decided to spend that money on something else. What do you think they spent their money on? Stop. They put in some well-being initiatives, leadership development programs. And this is unheard of. A company that's gone into administration is now investing in its people and looking at well-being as a number one priority issue. And a lot of people thought they were bonkers at that point. Five years later, not a huge amount of time, in five short years, they went from being in administration to being the best place to work for in the UK. They got 23,000 employees. In an employee engagement survey, 25% of their employees have been their number one for more than five years. Now, if you know anything about the retail sector, they have a transient workforce. People don't stay in, in their jobs for very long. They move on to something better. People didn't like working at Iceland. They loved it. And because their staff felt engaged and felt valued by their employer, they went the extra mile. And this is where it really translated into commercial success. In consumer polls, where do you think they featured? In terms of a con the consumer experience. One. They were second in the list. Number one was Audi. Tesco's, Waitrose, Sainsbury's. Marks and Spencer's weren't even in the top ten. Employee well-being isn't just about making your staff happy and putting a smile on their face. It directly translates to commercial success. And if you read the case studies on Iceland, they proved it. They made a brave and bold decision when they were on the verge of disappearing from high street they invested in something that, that, that most people would have said would have been a ridiculous thing to do. And they used that to transform their commercial experience. And this is where the first step is really understanding the experience your people are having. And there are ways of being able to do that. And that's part of my remit here today is to help you to understand what's on the bridge. Because often, you know, we can say it's workload and it's demand and lack of resources. But actually, unless we clearly understand what's on the bridge, any support intervention we put in place may be wide of the mark. And actually, maybe the, 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 the support intervention that's required in Nottingham is different to Manchester, or in, it's completely different to Portsmouth. And the better we understand the challenges our people are facing and be able to segment that by site, by department, by job function, the more clearly we can target those interventions. And that's why we've worked um, with the Health and Safety Executives model of the stress management standards. How many of you are familiar with the stress management standards? Okay, quite a few of you. So let's say a framework. For those who aren't familiar, I'll just I'll, I'll briefly talk through it. And it's essentially it's a seven-point framework to be able to understand the impact of stress in the workplace. So it's looking at number one, demands. So workload, work patterns, the work environment. Um, to find out whether work pressures are excessive and whether work patterns, the work environments are enabling employees to perform well whilst not putting their health at risk. Control. So how much say does a person have over the work and the way that they do their work? Um, in practice, look at issues like flexibility, having choice or influence about, uh, for example, the way the work is done or when they can take a break, those kind of things. Support. This includes encouragement, sponsorship, and, and resources provided by the organization. That could be things like employee assistance programs. It could be access to counseling, occupational health. Um, there are a variety of different support resources we can put in place. Or it could be policies, processes, procedures. Uh, and this can be broken down into peer support, management support. Now, if we are going to create a culture of well-being, it's all well and good that you've got senior management bought into this and you know, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. Unless we've got line managers that are champions of this well-being culture we want to create, it can actually fall down pretty quickly. So part of our process needs to be getting line managers to engage. We did some work with the local authority recently. At the senior management level, they bought into you know, you know, having a strategic wellbeing initiative. They engaged HR and health and safety. They had uh, a, a number of new policies. Um, they had an employee framework document. They had a management framework document. They had a risk assessment document. They had a new employee assistance program. They had an occupational health referral service. So they've done all of these wonderful things they put into place. And they put a document together regarding each of these um, different things that they put into place. It was about nine documents, average 20 pages on each document. How do you think they communicated it to their managers? No, they went one step further than that. 
They attach them all to an email and emailed it out to their manager. <laughs> they tick the box, we've communicated it to our people, and someone said communication. Actually, part of our, you know, if we're going to create an effective well-being initiative, if we're going to have an effective approach to managing workplace stress, how you communicate is so important. Sticking it on email, sending it out to a busy manager that's going to look at it as a low priority issue and either delete it or file it somewhere and never actually read it, doesn't translate into any kind of cultural benefit to the organization. Another organization, we were doing some management training programs recently, standing in a room like this, 200 of their senior managers from around the UK in a room. Uh, it's, it's actually part of their kind of canteen area where they just set up some chairs. Uh, and these guys will come into this area every day to have their lunch. And we were talking about their employee assistance program and asked how many of them knew that this existed. And of the, I don't know, at least 200 people in the room, there's only three people that actually knew that there was an employee assistance program in place. They were investing really heavily in this resource, but no one even knew that it existed, apart from the, the, the occupational health nurse, the HR manager, and the learning and development manager. So the rest of them were kind of sitting there looking at each other and thought, I didn't know this existed or what we can use it for. What was really interesting, from where they were sitting, there was a bloody poster on the wall <laughs> which they walked past a thousand times and no one paid the blindest bit of attention to it. Communication is key. And how we are communicating, how we are engaging people in this stuff. Because we need to be sure that they take this seriously. And often, line managers don't have the skills and confidence in dealing with these kind of issues. So they'll bury their head in the sand, or they'll leave it, or they'll just send them off to HR and let them deal with it. That's their problem. However, the line manager is first line support. If your computer breaks down, you phone the IT help desk, what do they usually tell you to do? <laughs> Reboot it, turn it off, turn it back on, control or delete, and if that doesn't work, what do they then do? <laughs> They'll normally refer you up to someone more technical. Now, you know, raise ticket will get someone to get back to you in a couple of days or something like that. And they'll know who to refer you on to. That's what our line manager's responsibility is. It's not to fix the problem necessarily, but to be able to engage the person at a, a basic level uh, to understand what the issue is and be able to refer them on to the most appropriate resource that's available in the organization. Whether that is uh, you know, uh, resources that are available like an employee assistance program, like access to counseling or occupational health or whatever else, or at the very least off to HR, um, we'll be able to uh, potentially be able to support them more effectively. So support, relationships. We mentioned relationships can suffer. So, so one of the, 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 the standards is uh, looking at how we can promote a positive working environment to avoid conflict and dealing with unacceptable behavior. Uh, this also includes identifying negative and potentially damaging behaviors that cause stress at work, like bullying and harassment. This is where obviously bullying and uh, harassment are, 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 are kind of mixed up with the whole stress issue. Role. Do people understand their role within the organization? Where the organization ensures that they do not have conflicting roles, which obviously could be causing stress. And something that many organizations are experiencing, something that many of you would have experienced as well, is change. Change is one of the demands. Uh, it's also one of the, the, the standards. So how organizational change, whether large or small, is managed and communicated within an organization. So we looked at the, the, the HSE's approach um, to risk assessing for workplace stress, and we thought it's a great starting point. But it was lacking in a few areas. We further developed that approach so we can use it a little bit more effectively. One of the things we found is just getting people to complete 35 questions um, you know, in a multiple choice fashion is a good starting point. But if you're going to be asking the question, it's really important that we ask um, some open format questions, get some, some, some um, quality feedback as well. Change the questions that are relevant for your organization. You know, we can use the framework, but, but actually, how can we further develop that approach that works for our organization? Um, the, it, it offers you the results in a traffic light format, which I'll show you some of the results if I can get the technology to work. I don't often use PowerPoint, so please forgive me if this doesn't work. Um, I might need some technical support. Raise the ticket. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, there we go. The ticket work, thank you. Okay, so ultimately this is how the, the HSC will display the, the results. Now we've further developed uh, this approach, so we've got uh, an online system which will be able to track uh, people's responses, we'll know who's completed the survey, who hasn't, and we're averaging about an 82.9% response rate, which means that we've got really good representative data, which we can then segment 
by site, by department, and we can also segment it by demographic grouping, so by age, by tenure, by sex, by job function, manager, non-manager. So we're able to slice and dice the data in a variety of different ways, so we can target specific issues that are impacting specific groups. And this obviously becomes very useful when we're putting in place interventions, because you can laser focus your interventions to, to the areas and, and, and parts of the organization that need it the most. And then we can split down even question by question. So you know, each question has its own weighting. The, the, the health and safety executive have, have a, a data set of organizational averages which is drawn for about 160 different companies. So you are, each question has its own median point. So it's not like 75% and above is good, 25% and below is less. Some questions have a far higher weighting. For example, I feel bullied at work it has a much higher weighting than I can decide when to take a break. It's a very, very useful way of approaching it. Green means you're doing well. Red is there's an urgent issue and we need to take action to do something about it. And with this organization, if we look at the manager support, I'm supported through emotion demanding work, my line manager encouragement at work. So we can see there's a line management issue. We've got managers that aren't necessarily effective at supporting their people and recognizing there's an issue. So when we've got this kind of data, we can then decide what more do we need to do. One of the next steps could be something like conducting a focus group. If we've got issues like bullying and harassment, we'll know that they tip that in the questionnaire, but what does that really mean? Does it mean that they've got a manager saying, you're not going home until this is done, or are they taking outside lunchtime and giving a few slaps around the head? We need to understand <laughs> what that means. And if nothing else, this will then start prompting what additional uh, diagnostic work do we need to do? So whether that's through focus groups or reviewing existing management data. This shouldn't be an isolated piece of work. This should fit in with everything else the organization is doing. If they have employee engagement surveys, if they've got absenteeism records, if they've got health and safety records, um, accident records, all of these kind of bits of management data can be really useful at building an overall picture of where we are within this organization. Utilization reports of, of services like the Employee Assistance Program will all feed into this process. And then we'll be able to build a report to get a, a clear sense of where we are, what action we need to take to start improving things, and essentially um, strengthen the collective bridge of that organization. So that's kind of the, 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 what we describe as the business stress risk re review approach. But I want to spend a bit of time talking to you about what's the impact to you. So I'd like to grab about three or four people, if you could, and I want to explore something in your groups. So that could be the, if, you're, if there's two of you sitting there, maybe the two people behind you. Grab a, a group of about three or four. I want to explore a couple of things with the people you're working with. Number one, within your organization, from a cultural and commercial perspective, or perspective, what's the cost of stress to your organization? Number two, from a risk management perspective, how exposed are you? So I just want you to explore some of the challenges that are potentially like, 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 likely to occur within your organizations. And finally, what potentially could you do to start addressing some of these issues? Okay, I'll give you a few minutes to explore that and we'll start wrapping up our discussion. Okay, so let's grow up people. Cultural, from a cultural commercial perspective, what is the cost for a risk management perspective? How exposed are you? And what can we begin to do to address these things? Um, cost of the contract. If it is a contract which is worth, that's a good question, I don't know how much it's worth. It's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? I'm managing a contract and I don't know how much it's worth. How are you going to know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going through the London Health and Workplace Charter. And stress management is one of the standards we make. It's raised more questions than what we are. I think the bottom line is that, as he said, the line management is going to be really powerful. The line management is getting hit from the bottom and getting hit from the low. 
Our biggest clients are insurance companies. We're working with all the major insurers at the moment, and I would say at least 45, 50% of our business at the moment is coming through or via insurance companies that understand that actually there's a huge and significant <coughs> risk exposure issue. Okay, be mindful of time, I do need to, to start wrapping up. What do you need to ask me to further aid your understanding on any of the things that we've covered here so far today? I appreciate we've only just, e not even scratched the surface, but what would you like to ask me to further aid your understanding on any of the things that we've introduced here this evening? How you can make a message across to senior management to really direct or steer how the workplace should work? The, the, that's a very good question. Did everybody hear the question? I, I think someone's going to run around the mic, but yeah. Um, so the question was, how do you get this message across to senior management? And what I would suggest is like you get any other serious message across to senior management. Ensure there is a strong business case. That it's well thought through, that you understand the serious implications, the cost, the, 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 the impact of not addressing this issue, and making it easy by offering a solution to that problem. If you're able to patch it up with a strong enough business case, you'll get the buy-in. And I know this because most of the big projects we get, we are speaking at board level, and we are getting the buy-in, and the message is filtering down. Our challenge is not necessarily to get board level to buy-in, it's about getting the line managers that have to be the champions of this culture to buy-in. Because for them, it's, you're giving me another job, another responsibility, and I already have enough to do. Great. Any further questions? Anything else you need to ask me to further your question? Is it still O2? Do you need to be not what, Sorry, what's the legal remedy? Because that's always quite case law, as in personal injury. Is it, it used to be not hunted, but then it went to O2, didn't it? I, yeah, I'm not going to, uh, yeah, I'm not, I, I couldn't tell you the top of my head. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can come back to you on that, if that helps. Where do you start? But do you do the best place? Well, before we can start looking at what we do about it, the, the, the most effective place to start is to understand the impact, understand what it's costing us as an organization, and using some kind of a, uh, a, a risk assessment approach, whether that's using our approach as the business stress risk review, or through the employee engagement survey, or some kind of method to understand so what is the, the impact to our people, to our workforce. Our workforce is our most valuable resource. But also, looking at existing management data, if you don't have the resource or the ability to do any new piece of diagnostic work, look at what data you do have access to, whether it's ICD and records, staff turnover, or anything else that will help us to build a picture. Uh, and then that will hopefully help you to build a strong business case. I think one of the things um, we have as a challenge where I work is HR and health and safety. I think sometimes they say stress is a HR issue, sometimes they say it's a health and safety issue. What would you suggest, or how do you think we could work together and make this? It's a cross-functional business issue. Yes. It's not a health and safety or HR. It's not a learning development issue. And companies that will be HR-led will do it in a very different way. You know, the oil and gas companies do it as a health and safety issue, have a, a very different approach. We find that actually the companies do it health and safety-led tend to invest in it and in it more effectively and take it more seriously. But I would suggest we look at this as a cross-functional business issue. If we get senior management buy-in, and we've got a steering committee which has you know, members which are health and safety, which are health and HR, and we are looking at it from a variety of different perspectives, that's where we're going to get the ultimate benefit. It's also an employee benefits issue, because we'll have things like some of the employee benefits schemes that are wrapped up as part of this. So we need to ensure that we get uh, effective buy-in from all the different people, the, all, all the key stakeholders that will be involved in this. Great, that's a good question. Thank you. How much yes. so on? And the breaking point is very personal. Of course. Um, you mentioned frameworks which work on the law of averages. From your experience or with the society, so on, the breaking point, and it's hard to put a business case on a personal breaking point. And that's where the HR one comes in. So from your experience, do you think the breaking point is altering within industry as a trend? Like you said, there are set groups. And that's a great point. Every individual has their own individual break point. If we have fail safes in place where we're able to engage our people effectively and pick up when there are changes in an individual, hopefully we should be able to ward it off at the past way before anyone gets near the breaking point. Because I fully appreciate that, you know, as we've said, that that nurse in the Kate Middleton story, it was a stupid prank phone call from a radio presenter from Australia, but that wasn't what caused the break. It was the fact that she had other load in other areas of her life. 
And this is the key thing, the better we understand our people, the better opportunities we have to engage our people, the quicker we can pick up where there's an issue and take appropriate action and plug them into the resources that most organizations invest in anyway. But those, that investment often is going to waste because we tick the box, but nobody ever uses these resources. And if I gave you the utilization reports for half of our clients that we work with on things like employee assistance program, they average about two, two and a half percent utilization. Not because people aren't stressed, they don't know it exists, they don't trust it, they don't understand what it's for or what you can use it for. Managers don't know what it's all about. And this is the key thing, is that if our managers are more effective at being able to recognize when there's an issue, have the skills and confidence, hopefully we can pick it up way before people get anywhere near break. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, it was just additional ones. Have you noticed the difference in the Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, the pressure on people is increasing. It doesn't matter what industry you look at, the pressure across the board tends to be increasing. Um, we are noticing in some industries that there are specific trends uh, that, 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 that exist. And, you know, also in particular demographic groups. Does anyone know, for example, when it comes to suicide, who's the, the most at-risk group? No. 18 to 35 year old males are the most at-risk group. So you know, we're starting to pick up trends in particular areas and pockets of society. Um, so we need to get better at uh, not only recognizing that, but take action. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're going to have to wrap up now. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to spend some time with you here today. If any of you would like more information, we've just published a white paper on how to go about conducting an effective business stress risk review. We can offer that to you free of charge. If you're interested in that, my two colleagues who are putting their hands up now are at the back. Um, if you give them your details, they've got a sign-up sheet or drop them a business card. I've got a business card here at the front here as well. Get in touch. We've got lots of free resources which are available to you. Uh, we're more than happy to share them with you. Once again, thank you so much for giving me your time, and hopefully, I'll get to talk to you before I leave today. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Neil. I think I've, I've never seen Tower Bridge draw like that, but I'll be honest, it was two things. These two diagrams meant such an awful lot to me. I don't just that that. Linking that with the, the stress definitions from your guy on the, you know, the, the engineer on the aircraft and linking it with that, that just makes so much sense. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for that. I much appreciate it. Um, so as Neil has said, if you want to find more, a couple of his colleagues will be around. You can the business cards, etc. Um, we want to move uh, briefly into the AGM. Um, if you do need to go, a committee member will be somewhere hovering there to collect uh, feedback forms. Obviously, we welcome as many of you that can stay to just support us for another 15 minutes. Um,